I have two more composers for you in this unit that focuses of, of music on music around the wars, especially around the time of World War II. The next two pieces are pieces that are directly affected by war in their actual creation. And they will actually give us completely different style characteristics. They are musically very different, but they are created from a sort of common time period and a common um, event being World War II. Olivier Messiaen is where we start. The French composer lived from 1908 to 1992. In 1941, he, get, he wrote, composed the quartet for the end of time. Messiaen was, uh, at this time, not simply sitting at home composing. He was a prisoner of war in a prison camp. He had been in the French forces, was captured, and sent to a prison camp. His composition, the Quartet for the End of Time, is written under the most bizarre of circumstances. You might think this would be a time that he would compose music that everyone in the camp would get, that it would be written to be accessible by all the different nationalities of people that were men that were imprisoned in this camp. But that's actually strangely not the tr not how it is. The Quartet for the End of Time is a perfectly good example of Mo Messian's own modernist, semi-modernist kind of compositional style. But how it's received, it's received in this prison camp in a way as if it were written like Soviet realism, or it's supposed to be obvious to everyone. It's very interesting. Let me read a little bit to you from some notes that I have, and let me explain. So, Messian is captured and put into a prison camp, and one of the guards of the prison camp realized who Messian was, that he was a famous French composer. The guard of the, in this camp is not uh, French. And so he actually allows Messian to have writing utensils and paper. Um, that I, some people say it was toilet paper, but I don't think it actually was. And he gets permission from the camp commandant to perform the piece that Messian writes. Messian composed a quartet for not a string quartet. He composed for the, 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 the instruments that they had. The piano is broken. They had trouble getting reeds for the clarinet. The cello is, I think, was missing a string. So I'm pretty sure it, it doesn't need the fourth string. I think the lowest string, you don't need it for this piece. As I say, the challenges were great for this piece even to exist. And you'd think maybe in a prison camp where you're not maybe getting food, enough food, and your, your, your fate is uncertain, why would Messian go to the trouble of, of doing this? But he, he does. His Messian style of composition is really, in a lot of ways, modernist. It's esoteric. It's elitist. Messiaen was fond, before and after the war, of writing music that, for example, reflected an adoration, a Catholic, Roman Catholic adoration of religious things, an adoration of the Virgin Mary, an adoration of Christ's death and resurrection, an adoration of angels. Very biblical, very colorful, and intense religious uh, intent. Or he was interested in figuring out how to transcribe bird song. I mean, we say birds sing, but have you ever noticed that they don't sing like a major scale or something, unless you've got a parrot or something that you've trained. They sing their own weird scales and rhythms, and yet they're musical, but that's not human singing. So he figures out how could you write down bird song and incorporate it into human music making. This is a really, he's got other ideas, I'll tell you about them in a minute, but it's a very um, um, remote, kind of musical style. It's not sort of sing it, whistle it. It's not Carmina Burana by any means. And yet, this is what Messiaen composes in this style in the prison camp. Um, so Alex Ross uh, is a, is a, was a music reviewer for The New Yorker, and um, he writes this um, in, uh, in, a re in an article, and it's also in the book called The Rest is Noise. The book is on the bookshelf right outside my office about head height. I just mentioned that. Here's what he writes, and this is um, what Messian has told the writer. 
some of it we're not sure if it's actually, if, if Messian's remembering correctly, but it's the best we've got. Here's what he says. The most ethereally beautiful music of the 20th century was first heard on a brutally cold January night in 1941 at the Stalag 8A, prisoner of war camp in Görlitz, Germany. The composer was Olivier Messiaen, the work quartet for the end of time. Messiaen wrote most of it after being captured as a French soldier during the German invasion of 1940. The premiere took place in an unheated space in Barrack 27. By the way, this is January in Germany. It's really cold. A fellow inmate drew up a program in an Art Nouveau style. So there was a fellow prisoner of war who was an artist and he draws, he makes a program or a poster that looks Art Nouveau. People are doing what they do even though they're prisoners. To which an official stamp is affixed on this poster or this program, Stalag 8A, 49 Geprüft. I don't, can't remember how to say 49 in German, but that means approved by the camp commandant. Sitting in the front row and shivering along with the prisoners were the German officers of the camp. The title, Quartet for the End of Time, does not exaggerate the ambitions of the piece. An inscription in the score supplies an image from the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation is the last book in the Christian Bible in the New Testament, if you have a Two Testament Bible. Um, in homage to the angel of the apocalypse, who lifts his, head, his hand toward heaven saying, there shall be time no longer. The angel is proclaiming in the book of Revelation, here is the end of time, and this is the end of the world, the angel of the apocalypse. And Alex Ross then says, this is actually the gentlest apocalypse imaginable. The movements of this quartet then describe different scenes, different vignettes in this end of time moment. Let me give you a, a little bit of um, Messian's own words. This is what Messian said about his piece. Uh, he says, um, the Stalag was buried in the snow. There were 30,000 prisoners, French for the most part, with a few Poles and Belgians. The four musicians played on broken instruments. Etienne Pasquier's cello had only three strings. The keys of my upright piano remained lowered when depressed. It's on this piano with my three fellow musicians dressed in the oddest way, I myself wearing a bottle green suit of a Czech soldier, completely tattered, wearing wooden clogs, clogs on the feet, large enough for the blood to circulate despite the snow underfoot, that I played my quartet for the end of time before an audience of 5,000 people. The most diverse classes of society were mingled. Farmers, factory workers, intellectuals, professional servicemen, doctors, priests. Never before have I been listened to with such attention and understanding. Isn't that amazing? Here's this piece that's written in a very elitist, far-fetched, style. The harmonies are clustery. Messian creates his own synthetic modes and moves through them in these weird cycles. The, the harmonies are really sort of cyclic. They're not progressions like 2-5-1. They're sort of cycles of chords that sort of overlap and circle around. It's not easy music to listen to, as you may try when you listen. And yet, the audience is wrapped in this. They're silent and, and getting it. That's powerful. Tira. One of the things that Messian um, is known for is his, was his um, synesthesia. Synesthesia is when one sense gets in on in stimuli for the other senses. For example, you hear a sound, but you see a color. We had a clarinet player a few years ago that had synesthesia. Um, uh, you smell something and you see a color. It's often colors and smells or hearing, things like that. Um, and they suggest it's in the brain where maybe neurons are too close, neural pathways are too close to each other and they sort of bleed over. So when Messian says that he conceives of parts of his work, like the quartet, as blue-orange, 
he actually means it. He says these chords to me look blue orange. And so chords that are placed maybe a tritone apart sound blue and orange. That's what they sound like. It's it's really pretty neat. The um so we have we have these blocks of moving sound. We have this sort of ecstasy of adoration of this angel at the end of time. I mean, geez, you're in a prison camp and you don't know how your life is going to go. This might be a good time to sort of fix on this moment before all is destroyed or all is saved. Um, there is in his work some of the structure of high modernism. As I said, cycles of pitches, synthetically created modes, the purpose is to cycle here, like architecture. It's like looking at beams and things that make up a huge giant building. Here are the style features for Messian. One, synthetic modes give pitch and harmonic content. Synthetic modes give pitch and harmonic content. He's not trying to write in D major or F major. He's making up his own modes his own collections of scales. Two, cycles of rhythm and melody provide the structure. Cycles of rhythm and melody provide the structure. We're being cyclic, we're not doing progressions and phrases and cadences. Three, music links to the natural and, if I may say, the supernatural, or if you prefer, the divine. Music links to the natural and the supernatural or divine. Last one. There is a strong illustration of the eternal sense of time, the eternal sense of time, by means of extreme rhythmic and notation, uh, sorry, extreme rhythm. No, no, no. Ha, sorry, let me start over. Strong illustration of eternal sense of time via extreme rhythmic notation and blocks of actual blocks of sound. Extreme rhythmic notation, what do I mean? Messian is the guy that will write 364 as a time signature or 732 or 81. <laughs> he uses these rhythmic things on the page. He's not writing in 4-4 time. He somehow needs to say more with the way it's notated the blocks of sound that we hear, it could be written with lots of ink, 364, but the 64th note is going by at the speed of, say, 1 64th equals 40. So we can have these very static yet moving blocks of sound. In a way, we won't hear music like that until we get to Arvo Pert um, in post-postmodernism. The next composer I want to compare that to is Benjamin Britten. Some of you are actually working on Benjamin Britten, so I'll try not to step on your paper much. Um, Benjamin Britten is a 20th century English composer. He lived from 1913 to 1976, about the same span of time as Olivier Messiaen. As an English composer, he was brought up listening to the great English compositions of, uh, for example, Elgar. He was friends with Von Williams. He knew the works of Holst. He also knew the works of sacred English cathedral music, which this course unfortunately skips over entirely, and it's a pretty intense body of repertoire. He uh, especially, it ha he has a broad scope as a composer. He finds indeed a talent for writing opera in a very 20th century modern genre. I know um, some of you are working on some of his operas. He writes opera, he writes sacred music, he writes chamber music. Uh, famous among his pieces are The Young Person's Guide for the Orchestra. That gets played all the time. That's actually based on a Purcell melody. Um, he writes a serenade for tenor, horn, and strings. To be sung, the tenor that sings it is Peter Pierce, who was um, Britain's lifelong partner. Um, he was a pacifist in uh, the, in World War, beginning in before World War II, he actually sailed to the U.S. to get away from the war sentiment that was increasing throughout the 1930s into the 40s in, in England, that there's going to be a war and everybody should fight in it because this is the thing to do. He, he actually said that he did not wish to do that, so he sails to the U.S. Um, it's at this time that he writes the choral suite for Christmas, well, it's not for Christmas, the choral suite called Ceremony of Carols. It's for women's chorus and harp. 
However, um, we're going to look at a, at a work that is actually so far, it's the latest work on our listening list to date. We're actually making progress. Opus 66, written in 1962. It is the War Requiem. The War Requiem. Realize Britain is writing as a, an Anglican sort of person in the 20th century. He's not writing this like Verdi, who is a Catholic. The Requiem Mass to an English Anglican believer is not really part of the worship service. That just doesn't, we don't do requiems really anymore. But Britain writes one. He has a visit after the war to give recitals, a series of visits to give recitals to concentration camp survivors, people who survived the Holocaust. Britain tours with other musicians and they do recitals for them. And this, these series of recitals colored the rest of his output. The pieces he wrote after these visits to these survivors made it changed the way he composed. The War Requiem was written for the construction, the dedication of the new Coventry Cathedral. Coventry Cathedral was bombed, the old cathedral, was bombed during World War II by the Germans, who said that it was uh, in the town of Coventry there was a secret munitions factory. And the English said, no, 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 there's nothing here. And the Germans bombed it and the cathedral burned to the ground. You can still go and see they've left the shell of the cathedral there. It's really moving to walk through. They built the new cathedral next to it. The retaliation for the bombing of Coventry, which was perceived and, and um, advertised as an unjust civilian target, although it actually turned out there was a munitions factory, um, or some sort, I think. Um, the, the retaliation was that the Allies bombed Dresden, another non-combatant town, and the Opera House of Dresden was burned to the ground. This is what prompts Richard Strauss to compose Metamorphosen, which I, if I had time, I'd talk about it, but we don't have time. So we have these composers that are mourning after the war this this loss that is is seems to be so pointless that Dresden was a civilian target as well. Guess what? There was a munitions factory or something nearby as well. There's no good way to go about this. So Britain decides he's going to write a requiem. In 1962, I mean, the war has been over for a long time. Americans find it easy to forget, I think, how much destruction World War II had, that people were on rations all the way into the 1950s. There wasn't any food to eat. Cities in Europe rubble until well past the 1960s. There's just so much to rebuild because so much was destroyed. It doesn't matter which side of the conflict you're on. So he writes this war, he takes the old Latin Requiem Mass and he writes it in a huge maximal scale. It's for huge orchestra and two choruses and soloists, a boys choir with the organ in the back and a choir up front with the orchestra and soloists. So you need a pipe organ, it has to be done in a church because where else are you gonna find a pipe organ? It doesn't have to be done in a church, but. Um, and not only does he use Latin text, the traditional Latin text that says, give rest to those who have died, grant them eternal rest, but he adds in the poems of Wilfred Owen. Wilfred Owen, who is a uh, World War I, uh, he was a poet, an English poet, who some of his poetry came about in World War I, and it expresses the disillusionment at the time of the whole world, of, the, of, of Europe, with this, this war to end all wars. This idea of being sent forth from the rear lines by your generals behind you to die horribly gassed and in trenches and things. Wilfred Owen's poetry is shocking and vivid and full of disillusionment. And Britain uses these poems um, to thread them in against the Latin text. So we hear English and we hear Latin layered in together. I've asked you to listen to um, the Dies Irae, which is pretty long, so you're going to need to make some time to do it. Um, the Dies Irae has nine sections. Now that I've listened to the Verdi Requiem, his Dies Irae was plenty long as well. Um, the, the movement is built on a C to F sharp motive. That is a tritone. The devil's interval, right? It is not a perfect fifth. It is an imperfect fifth, if you will. And there is a... Um, a balance between man versus God, human versus God, flawed human beings that cause destruction, and the prayer to God to heal and to save from this destruction. 
the um, dies irae is in this fantastic quintuple meter. Dies irae, dies ila, secute ste David cum sibila. It's like a crippled march. Think about people who have been maimed fighting in a war, and they can't march nice and straight in two, four time. They have to hobble because they have to. There's no choice. The text that is woven into the Dies Irae is a retelling of the story of Abraham and Isaac. And let me see if I can summarize it relatively quickly. In the Bible story, the Old Testament story, the um, Pentateuch um, in, in the Bible, um, Abraham is commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac to show that Abraham is a true believer and a true follower of God. And Abraham, he's, he's waited decades to actually have a son. So Isaac is like, this is it. It's his only son. What's he going to do? Oh, his only legitimate son. So he takes Isaac up to the sacred mountain and he actually, Isaac is ready to be sacrificed. And at the last minute, the, the, the point of the story is that at the last minute, an angel says, don't do it, Abraham. Don't kill the, the boy. There's a, a, goat, a ram, a sheep in the bushes. Kill that for the sacrifice instead to show your devotion to God. And so Isaac is freed, and it's okay. Phew, close call. Wilfred Owen's poem takes this story and uses Abraham's name as Abram, the name he had before he was a man of God, when he was just a, a non-Hebrew non-believing in God. He became chosen of God and changed his name to Abraham. So Abram takes his son, takes him up to the mountain, and puts him on the altar. And the angel says, don't do it, Abraham. Don't do it. Don't sacrifice your son. I'll give you a, a ram instead. And, it's, and it says, and he took his knife and slew his only son and half the seed of Europe. Wilfred Owen's poem says, the carnage of all the young men in World War I is, could, if only we had listened, if only the Abraham, the old man, and here we're thinking all the old politicals, the old generals, the people who are not out there fighting, if they had just listened and, and heard the word of the Lord, perhaps, saying, don't do that. And yet, flawed human beings do it anyway and sacrificed half the young men of Europe. Truly, if you go to villages anywhere in Europe, you will still see monuments to the slain from World War I. Villages are depopulated because all the young men are dead. They're killed in war. That's why World War I was such a disillusionment for the next generation, that people who came back were traumatized. They're, this we, we thought we had it all. We thought we were all sort of headed for this new glorious romantic thing, and then no. So Britain positions this shocking text in the midst of the Dies Irae, that Latin hymn of judgment on the last day. It's a scary last day. The dead will rise, and this has been foretold from the ages. There's ashes blowing around. It's very apocalyptic. And Britain suggests that, look, this is the problem. Human beings are causing such, this is like the end of the world, and there are two choices, total destruction, or gosh, can we hope for salvation? So you need to listen to that. Um, the last movement in Paradiso is the, real, is, the, is the salvation, the resolution, the hope. Britain is not a hopeless, embittered composer. This is not an expressionist work of despair and madness. Britain finally brings this maximal thing to a close, and we hear the boys' choir and the organ in a different space in the room, um, and singing in, in into paradise. Let it let his soul let our souls be led into paradise. Completely moving. I, I can't even. It's it's just an amazing work. Here are some style characteristics for it, which will finish up our little bit about the war. So this is my last composer here. One tonal and rhythmic palette. The tonal and rhythmic palette is an outgrowth of romantic expression. The tonal and rhythmic palette is an outgrowth of romantic expression. It sounds pretty tonal. It sounds like keys. Yes, there are cadences. There are phrases. Yes, there are. It's not abandoning that, but it's like this is what happened to romanticism after it sort of molded in the drawer. Like they were, oh, we kept it too long and now it's a little bit ripe. Two, 
The motivic development governs the form and the content. The motivic development is in charge of the musical form, the shape of the big movement, and the how phrases are constructed, what they're made of. In a lot of ways, it's a little bit like Richard Strauss, who composed melodies of little bits of motives and let that spin out into longer pieces. Three, there is large organizational architecture. Large organizational architecture. The DA series is in nine sections. The tritone C to F sharp is the is the architecture that holds that sprawling nine move nine section work together. It finally becomes part of the five seven chord because there's a tritone in the five seven and it resolves. Hmm, how about that? That couldn't that the way the movement is conceived is not sonata form. It's not a rondo really. It's not. It's it's because of this large scale vision of how things should resolve. Um, Oh, oh, the archi and I should, I'll just add that the architecture, you don't have to put this on, this on the style characteristic, but the architecture is actually audible. It's not modernist elitism, like, shh, don't hear the hidden structure. It's just there. But we're supposed to hear it and go, oh, thank heaven, there is hope for us. Resolution equals the salvation of the soul. I feel so much better now. Oh, the piece is over. How about that? So we are supposed to hear that organizational texture. If you wanted another style characteristic, you could certainly say that distance as a physical effect is a good style characteristic for some several works of Britain. Distance as a physical effect. In other words, the boys and the organ in the back, far away from where the orchestra and choir are. It's meant to sound far away like it's in another room. Um, I'll just mention as I'm turning it off here, um, one of my favorite pieces of Britain is the fanfare for St. Edmundsbury. I wish I could put this on the music listening list for you, but the, it's already such a big list. It's a fanfare for trumpets. Three different groups of trumpets, get this, positioned on three different hillsides. Not three different places in the room, but three different hillsides. So each group plays, but the distance means that you can't coordinate it exactly. You hear from a distance. Oh, it's happening. And then when they all play together, you know what? If it doesn't line up perfectly, how could it? Because you're like a quarter of a mile away from each other. It's so cool. Um, Britain does that in other pieces as well. I'm thinking here of um, the Serenade for Tenor, Horn, and Strings, where the horn player has to go off stage to play the final horn call. So it sounds like it's coming from a distance. So it's a good style characteristic for Britain. He's fond of evoking distance by actually using distance. Um, so that's music around the, or especially around World War II, um, and some links to World War I, um, and some four, four really very different composers. Um, some have similar style characteristics, but they're also quite diverse in what they're attempting to do with their music. So I hope you enjoy. Make sure you do listen to all these pieces. <laughs>